Okay. Thank you all very much. I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing here in Newark, in particular talk about interactions between physical fitness and genetics on both behavioral and biological markers of Alzheimer's risk in older African Americans. Um, we represent the Aging and Brain Health Alliance. You've seen this uh, logo and sign all around. Uh, we have two missions, and I'm going to mostly talk about the science, but I want to briefly talk about some of our community programs. Uh, we offer brain health and Alzheimer's prevention programs to older African Americans in Newark. Um, our community engagement is led by a, a trio of our senior leadership. Uh, two of them are here. Glenda Wright, who you've met, oversees all of our relationships with public and subsidized housing, and from that recruitment from people living in federally subsidized housing, Glenda's over here. Uh, Reverend Wilson can't be with us today, but he oversees all of our programs and relationships with churches, um, as well as more broadly through sort of the faith-based community. And Dolores is uh, over here. Um, Dolores does a number of roles. First, she does uh, what we call participant uh, satisfaction. We learned early on that we spent too much time recruiting and not enough on retention. Her job is to make sure that everybody um, is happy when they come and that they stay happy for the two years before they come back. She also oversees all of our consenting. So unless they get through the consenting process with her, she explains it. And uh, that's really a critical part. Nothing happens unless uh, we get through the consenting, of course. Um, together, they bring 200 years of collective experience with the local African American communities. Everything we do um, is basically super supervised by them and nothing happens that they're not happy and approve of. They're supported by uh, a broad team of people, um, many of whom are here today who you'll get to meet, um, who oversee the various aspects of our programs. Um, we have probably about uh, a I'd say about a dozen people on our community engagement team, most of them hired from the community who work on various aspects and programs within the community, various different subsets. Um, and all of these people, uh, most of them are going to be here this e today or this evening. Um, let me just give you a brief overview of, of how it is that we do community engagement. Um, the first is long-term investment in community health. We began 17 years ago, so we've been in the community for 17 years. And for the first eight years of that, there was no research. It was just public health, community education programs. And then only in about 2015, we decided to begin a research program and we went back to all these partners who knew us for eight years and only then began to build a research program out of those eight years of sort of community awareness and trust. Share the wealth. Uh, there's an old Yiddish proverb that translates loosely as money is like manure. If you spread it widely, wonderful things will grow. But if you hold it all together in one place, it's just a stinky pile of tukheskaka. So that guides our principle. We try to spread the wealth around. As I mentioned, we have about 15 people. We hire in the community. We work with local vendors. Um, we put money out to all of our partners. Uh, one of our partner churches that we've done a lot of work with over the years. They had a lot of uh, leaking in their sanctuary uh, that no longer happens thanks to what they call the Rutgers roof that they put on the church thanks to a lot of the money they come. So we spread it around we, as, as our funding has, has increased. We want to make sure that our partners also feel they're benefiting. Uh, we have a general 80-20 rule. Um, for the first eight years, it was 100% public health and community engagement. Um, since then, as our research has grown, we still spend about 80% of our time and our effort and our resources on the community health, the community needs. Um, by and large, most people in the community see us and experience us as bringing value to them, as doing community programs. And the research is a little something we talk about on the side at the end, the last sort of 20%. However, of course, our community partners understand that that side thing, that 20%, is what, of course, pays the bills for everything else we do. And the fact that we've sort of increased by about tenfold our community programs because we've added the research. We do outreach to multiple African-American communities. I've underlined the plural here because there is no singular the African-American community. Um, we have, that's why we have such a large engagement team. We have people who focus on the uh, low-income public housing, uh, people who focus on churches. We have others with the, with, uh, the mosques and the Muslims, with uh, veterans, um, with returning citizens, post-incarceration returning citizens is a group we work with. Um, so there are many, many different subsections. So we really think of there being multiple African-American communities and we have people who target and focus on each of them, generally from each of these different subsections of the communities. Uh, we do varied and frequent programs because there's so many different sub-communities we work with, um, and we have a very large staff. We're doing these days about one or two events per week. Um, and we don't just go into some place once. Um, we usually, particularly for the public housing, um, we try to go to each place at least twice a year, sometimes three, because of what we've learned is essentially a dose-response curve um, approach to recruitment. The first time you go, nah. 
not interested. Thanks for the lunch and the swag. Um, but then you come back six months later and they're like, oh, you haven't just come and gone. You've returned. And then we always ask our VIPs, our, our, our very important participants, to stand up and be recognized. And they look around the second time and they say, hey, well, you know, she did it and he did it. Well, maybe it's not such a terrible thing. And so we think that very times you have to come back to the same people multiple times as they see their friends begin to come. So sort of a dose response. You can't just hit them once. You have to keep coming back. And for many of our partners, some of the churches, we've been working with them for over 15 years. So we're very much clearly a part of the community that they know will be around for a while. Men are just a pain in the ass. Um, and I think all the women here will, 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 will agree. Okay, Men, we, we, we think we know everything and we think we're superheroes who are invulnerable, which means health and education, nah, not interested. Doctors, I'll see you next year. So when we began in 2015 with the research, we had about 7% men. Um, and uh, clearly that's not going to make it when it comes to talking about sex as a biological variable. Since then, I'd say probably at least a quarter, if not a third of all of our activities are just to sort of focus on men. Men are difficult and expensive and time consuming. They won't come to health or education, but they do come to our soul brain dance parties, um, <laughs> which you were all invited to. They come to our classic car show and brain health fair. Um, and uh, they come, so basically music, sports, cars, uh, dance, food. Um, and then the, the health comes in at the, at, at the end. So we basically have to trick the men through that, or at least uh, come to them with what they're interested in, and then they find the health and education and the research afterwards. So in the last couple of years since we've begun to do this intensive, we've gone from 7% men to 25% men. And that's still not our target. We'd like to get up to where it is in the community, which is about 35%. There is not equal in the community. Um, but we've made a lot of progress, and but it's taken a lot of work and, and effort. And we have partner input via community stakeholders board. You hear the word community advisory board? Uh, we don't bring people in to advise us. We bring them in to be stakeholders. So everyone who's on our board are not just telling us what to do. They're representing their own interests. So all the churches, we have at this point 40 some odd churches, mosques, senior centers, public housing, all of them have a seat at the table to influence how this affects them. Um, the bottom line is there's no quick, easy, or cheap way to successfully recruit older African Americans to aging research. This is sort of the bad news. People come to us all the time and say, well, you're recruiting so many people. What's a quick trick I can do? Tell me something. And we always say there's nothing quick, easy, or cheap. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of investment. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of people. But when you do that and you do it over a long term, then you can begin to recruit large numbers of African Americans. And so that's what we've been doing. And through our university community collaboration, uh, we conduct research on aging and brain health. Our pathways we've recruited since 2015 over 500 older African Americans, and they joined for two reasons. The first is to improve their own brain health. We have a lot of programs that are open to everyone in the community, but we have special VIP programs for our participants. So for most people view us not just as joining a study, but of joining a program that's focused on them and their health and their access and coming to conferences like this, among other things. Um, but to support research on healthy aging, just about everyone who participates in our study knows somebody, loves someone who had had dementia. And so for a lot of the people, their motivation isn't just the few hundred dollars of the, of the research fees. It's their way of being give, offering them an opportunity to fight back. Okay, they see us as offering them a way to pay it forward to the next generation um, and to do it in the memory of somebody um, who they loved who uh, it came too late. This is supported uh, primarily by uh, NIH and uh, uh, bus plus a number of other donors. So who, is, who do we enroll? People who identify as African American or black, age 60 or older, speak English fluently, um, and they come in for a three day, what we call the Rutgers brain check. Um, day one is saliva, blood tests, brain health, immune health. Pat Fitzgerald Bocarsley oversees our, 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 our immune health studies. The second day, cognition, health, fitness, lifestyle assessments, another two and a half hours. This is what Goldie and I were talking about, sort of deep phenotyping. Um, day three, they come in for MRI, brain imaging, and EEG. And between days two and three, they do four days of home sleep monitoring using a digital sleep monitor I'll talk about later. So this is all the data that we collect, and they come back every two years or every one year once they turn 80. So what have we learned? Uh, we've learned a lot of things. I want to focus particularly on exercise and fitness. Uh, we measure fitness. This is Dolores here demonstrating. Uh, we use a six-minute walk. It estimates the maximal VO2 capacity. Now, we talked before about some of these cognitive tests um, and fitness. 
if we look at this across our cohort, um, we see that there's no correlation between fitness and either delayed recall, MMSE, or digit span. So if you just use standard off-the-shelf measures, you'd say, well, the fitness in this cognitively healthy cohort doesn't seem to be correlated with cognition. Um, but we think that's not a problem with the N or with, with the fitness, but with the cognitive measures that are being used. So if standard neuropsych measures of memory and cognition don't correlate within our healthy cohort with fitness, what might? And that brings us back to work we did back in the 1990s in sort of our a computational neuroscience, which was sort of the focus of my lab. Uh, we developed computational models of the medial temporal lobe, the hippocampus, and we argued that the, the input-output areas, the entorhinal cortex and the dentate gyrus, were responsible for encoding the representations, defining the code, the memory code, and that the other areas of the hippocampus, CA1, subiculum, were where that code, that encoding was stored. And what that means is that if you look at Alzheimer's, which begins primarily more in the entorhinal and parahippocampal regions in the very earliest preclinical prodromal phase, which is the one we're interested in, that is primarily this encoding representation areas that are being disrupted, not the episodic memory storage areas, which are not disrupted until later in the progression of Alzheimer's. Now, this is important because all of these tests that we've talked about, I think some of the ones that Robert described as well, these are all based on um, episodic event memory storage, or most of them are. And so our prediction then from this work in the 1990s that we did is that preclinical, pre pre-symptomatic AD may only affect the representation of new learning, uh, but not the episodic event memory storage. And yet all of these standard measures that are used in dementia clinics and most sort of clinical trials are based on episodic event, MMSE, RAVEL, delayed paragraph recall. Those are all the func those are all the cognitive functions we think are depending on the CA1, CA3 subiculum, which are definitely damaged later in Alzheimer's, but probably not affected at all in this preclinical prodromal stage of interest to us. So what behavioral measures would be sensitive to this kind of encoding and representation? What we've argued is that you want to focus not on memory recall, but on generalization of learning. By generalization, I mean, let's say you experience the first time broccoli, and it makes you sick, okay? You do one trial learning, but then you, you get cauliflower, and now you're posed a problem. Um, do I eat it or do I avoid it? And the, and the conundrum is because cauliflower is like broccoli, but not exactly. So that's generalization. And the reason that that's important is that we think that critically depends on these interrhinal parahippocampal areas. And so when you damage the hippocampus, particularly these, these areas of the hippocampal region, what happens is learning is intact, but generalization is impaired. What you get is rigid memnonic function. You can learn, but you can't generalize to something new. So it's sort of a rigidity. Um, one of the ways we test this, we have a number of different tasks we call the Rutgers generalization tasks. Um, an example is where we train people in phase one for a variety of rules. And phase two, the rule stays the same. So the rule isn't changing, but the context is changing, either a different irrelevant shape or a different irrelevant color. So the rules stay the same from phase one to phase two, but in phase two, you have to apply it to a different set of stimuli. In earlier work that we did with, with NYU, for our friends from NYU in the early 2000s, we showed that in a population with hippocampal atrophy who are cognitively normal, um, only generalization, phase two generalization errors were impaired, not delayed paragraph recall, not phase one. So which brings us back, if this doesn't affect generalization, will affect generalization. And what we see here is that if we, rather than the standard measures, if we look at fitness versus generalization, we do see a big effect here, um, but not in everyone. And in particular, I'm going to skip over here because I'm coming to the end. If you look at ABCA750, which has a modest direct association um, with Alzheimer's, and you sort people by their ABCA750, what you see is those people with the risk genotype show no relationship between fitness and generalization. Those people with the risk uh, non-risk genotype show an even stronger relationship. And so what that suggests then is that this ABCA750, which has only a very modest direct relationship to dementia, may actually be, be modulating the degree to which fitness is neuroprotective. So that was an observational cross-sectional study. We looked at X, we wanted to ask the interventional question, can we help these people with low fitness and low cognition improve on both? Um, and so we, have a, we had a, 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 an exercise intervention, five months of twice weekly cardio dance fitness, basically think Zumba to Motown music uh, was the gist. Um, and uh, after the session, we're gonna invite you all to see a little bit of what this kind of intervention is like, not right now. Um, and as predicted, after 20 weeks of this aerobic exercise intervention, only the carriers of the low risk ABCA750 genotype showed exercise related improvements. So those in the control showed no improvement. 
these are errors, so low is good. Um, those in the high risk genotype showed no cognitive advantage to the exercise, only those with the low risk variant of the ABCA750. Um, now this is not just to clarify, I skimmed over it, this is not the ABCA780 variant which has a direct relationship with Alzheimer's, it's, a, it's another SNP. So in summary, these older African Americans with a high risk variant um, show less benefit. And what this means is, and is Damali seems to have stepped out, but uh, Damali's going to talk about personalized medicine. It suggests that personalized medicine, specific to, Af to African Americans, at least here, for the, that there may be a sort of a lifestyle medicine, that if you have this risk variant, then exercise um, may be, uh, you may need more exercise than other people. Um, so how does exercise rewire our brains? And this gets to some of the other ways um, that we were trying to develop novel ways of assessing cognitive changes in a preclinical population. We do a 10 minute resting state scan. We divide that into 20, 30 second slices. We do a graph theoretic analysis of each of those slices. And we ask over those 10 minutes, how rigid or dynamic are the graphical networks across those 10 minutes? Is the brain conversations within the medial temporal lobe changing on its own dynamically or is it set? And what we find is we compute a measure of flexibility, so that people who have rigid cog dynamic connectivity, so the same subregions of the medial temporal lobe are connected throughout those 10 minutes, that we associate with cognitive decline and elevated Alzheimer's risk. Those who have flexible connectivity, the regions are changing who they're talking to and interacting with throughout the 10 minutes, that's the healthy medial temporal lobe. So we call this flexibility measure. And what we see in the dance intervention, if we look at this flexibility measure, so high is good, the more flexible, the more dynamic, the more changing it is, that the exercise intervention, after the exercise, we see an increase in this dynamic flexibility measure. Uh, moreover, if we look across all of everyone in our controls and our experimental group, what we see is that most of our exercise participants, those are the orange dots, are improving on both generalization and medial temporal flexibility. But what's particularly concerning is that many of our control participants, those who are not exercising, over six months, over five months, are declining on both generalization and on flexibility, suggesting the cost of being sedentary in this cohort is evident within half a year. So exercise promotes this medial temporal region flexibility. So let me briefly end in the last few minutes to tell you about a little bit some of the current directions. Um, uh, we've now, we have a, a new clinical trial uh, from NIH to do this as a full bore randomized clinical trial. Which aspects of different exercise? We have an active stretching toning uh, group, um, understanding more about the genetics uh, of this, and particularly now doing a, a blood pathology work um, and with Pat Bokarsley immunology work to understand how it is that exercise may be disease modifying or is it just providing a compensatory cognitive reserve. So really asking about the fundamental question about exercise, at what point is it intervening? Um, we have a number of other things that we're doing now. I'm going to just briefly run through them in 30 seconds. We have, I think, eight or nine posters from my students who are all lined up, or post trainees over here. There are a whole bunch of posters that talk about some of the other things we've learned from this cohort. Um, uh, we find that the other ABCA 780, this is something Goldie and I were talking about, or some of the people at NYU, the other ABCA 7, the one that's, that's the, the most important risk factor for for Alzheimer's in African Americans, that those people who self-report high quality sleep show no effect of the risk variant. So that suggesting that sleep, a lifestyle intervention, can compensate for the genetic risk factor. So okay, someone in my lab is telling me to, sh to shut up and they don't rarely get to do that. So I'm gonna respect that. Um, and uh, thank you all. Um, the rest of, uh, of, uh, of the work you can see in our posters that uh, are out there. Thank you. I'll take a couple of questions. Are there any questions? Yes? How do you join that uh, exercise movement? How do you join the exercise study? Um, you speak to Josh, who is, uh, is Josh in the room? Um, Josh is, uh, there's Josh, he's stepped out. She wants to join, you talk to Josh. Um, or Dolores here, Dolores oversees all our recruitment. Um, any, other, uh, any other questions? About that? Okay, still processing. Okay, John, yeah. Yeah? Hi, Joe and Pop at Brown University. When, when you were doing the, talking about the uh, generalization uh -huh. population, were, were, all, 
were all those people, they would be cognitively unimpaired by the standard measures? Yes, so they're all, everyone that we're enrolling, you know, it's Pathways to Healthy Aging in African Americans, that's what we call our program. Uh, so everyone is cognitively normal. Not everyone stays that way. Some of them, as we say, quote unquote, graduate from our program, um, but that's been relatively small so far. We're yeah, and so that's why these novel measures of network connectivity and novel cognitive measures are important because these people are basically at ceiling with standardized tests. So we're only really seeing it by able to look at more sensitive cognitive and neural measures. So is, there, is that going to be clinical screening or test? Well, that's somebody else's uh, question. But if anybody's, you know, that's certainly something we would hope is that things move from the research to the clinical setting. Um, but I think a lot of our results highlight that these standard neuropsych measures, MMSE, Ravel, and so forth, are fine for diagnosing somebody once everyone in their family and life knows they have a memory problem, but you need to have much more sensitive measures that are picking up 10 or 15 years. We've also done this in early onset familial AD, people who, who are genetically have a 100% chance, and we find that there are hippocampal dependent changes in generalization 15 years before people are expected, based on their genetics, to develop MCI or dementia. So based on these, these early onset familial families, we're seeing generalization changes literally more than a decade in advance. Question? Destiny? Destiny is, is there a, a microphone for her? No, actually. Oh, sorry. Somebody else has it. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, Shina Duodero from Georgia State University. Uh, my question was on the hippocampus, because um, I do a lot of work on preclinical AD and prodromal AD. So I wanted to know specifically what brain regions in the hippocampus and in the general brain are affected in the preclinical and prodromal stages. So I'll as a, that arrow that I showed going from the top left to the lower right, that sort of schematizes the progression, that you see the changes anatomical and functional earliest on in the parahippocampal and interrhinal cortex, um, and then only later do you see it in the hippocampal subfields, which are the ones that are more involved in the episodic memory. Hi, I'm Destiny from ASU. Um, so I was kind of wondering, like, what is like the big picture end goal for this? So obviously the issue here is access. So do you have like any ideas or any plans for like expanding this to more communities to be able to, um, you know, benefit, benefit. from? Benefit. Um, yeah. Well, we we think that uh, so at our research is focused in in Newark and the surrounding. Mm -hmm region mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's really where we focus all of our activities mm -hmm. um, but we are, are very eager to share our not only our our assessment tools the, the generalization tasks the the, 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 the the network imaging but also our uh, um, our community engagement from our soul brain dances to our classic car shows to our aging smart program so uh, we think that plagiarism is the most sincere form of flattery so anyone who wants to uh, borrow any of our materials our community engagement materials uh, we're happy happy to share all of it and most of it's on our website so if you go to our website all of our videos all of our community programs are are, are there uh, but it's somebody else's to take it to uh, another city which is where we stay uh, in this region hi I'm Kat Britt from Penn do you offer any kind of community participatory training opportunities or recommend one for those of us training uh, um, we are actually uh, in the planning stage to try to put together uh, the resources to uh, create opportunities to bring people in as essentially community engagement fellows to come in for two weeks. So one of the things that we'd like to do within a, a sort of a collaborative network is to create opportunities to offer either you know new investigators or community engagement staff to come join us for two weeks or a month and you know work with Dolores and Luce and, and Reverend Wilson and Glenda and the rest and just be part of our programs and then to go back and adapt them to local communities. Great, thank so you. So I think that's what you're saying. So we just have to sell that, but uh, that's the basic idea. Um, Michelle. Do you know if your um, graduation rate from your program is less than the conversion rate to MCI or dementia in the general community? Because that's a finding in and of itself. That Because I think it's actually unusual that your graduation rate is low, meaning that 
people maintain their cognitive, um, they don't convert to having MCI or dementia. You're saying that's happening at a low rate. Uh, and that if that is happening at a lower rate than in the general community, then by having being engaged in your program, you're helping the community age Right. Better. So th there's no doubt that our broad community engagement programs, as well as our specific targeted health programs for the participants, uh, undermines our, our conversion predictions, um, which is, I think is what you're saying. Undermines it in a way that's sort of good for the community, but, yeah. but bad mean, for there. Um, so that's certainly possible. It's also worth noting that we lost about eight to nine percent of our cohort to COVID, yeah. and we know that the uh, we know that the genetic and lifestyle risk factors for COVID mortality are the same as for Alzheimer's. So we suspect that that eight to ten percent of our cohort who died during the pandemic probably are overrepresented in the people who might have developed dementia in the next year or two. Mm -hmm. So we think looking at what we're seeing now, having had this sort of pandemic. Uh, potentially removing the potential converters yeah. um, sort of skews the statistics and prevents any meaningful comparison. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have, uh, we have one, one more question or so and then we'll go to the... Uh... I'm Fabian from New Jersey Medical School. I don't think I need a microphone because That's I okay. can speak quite loud. And my question is actually not really directly relevant to you at all, although you are title also refers to biological markers, and we, we had some other talks on biological markers, but I did not hear anyone talking about the, the neurofilament line. So um, that was the slide that I didn't show because uh, I told Victoria that uh, she had the right to shut me up. So uh, we are doing uh, neurofilament light, uh, plasma P-tau, um, and the beta amyloid uh, through collaborations with uh, uh, Zetterberg and Blenow. Um, and we do have some results there. And if you go uh, uh, out to our poster session, I think uh, uh, our postdoc here uh, is going to be presenting some of that. I need to cut it off because we need to move to the break.